ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Editor-in-Chief of Ideas for India, I extend you a very warm welcome. Uh, over the last two, three years, we've been seeing each other mostly on uh, screens. So it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, see all of you face to face. Um, today's event has two main uh, things. There's the first uh, Ashok Kotwal Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Professor uh, Debraj Ray. Then we'll have a short tea break. And after that, there's the uh, panel discussion to be moderated by uh, Amartya Lahiri and involving uh, Viral Acharya, Pranup Sen, and Yamini Ayer. Um, let me, uh, before uh, introducing Debraj, let me speak briefly about Ashok Kotwal, who uh, is, uh, many of you knew very well. He's the founder editor of Ideas for India. He is a very well-known name in development economics. Uh, there are classic Esferan and Kotwal papers, which were among the first to apply uh, the tools of you know, game theory, contract theory, economics of information to, to understand uh, the special features and problems of developing economies, their land markets, their labor markets, their credit markets, and so on. Uh, so, so he's a very well-known and pioneering figure in, in the area of uh, development theory. Uh, in the last 10 years of his life, Ashok uh, sort of put all his energies in, in building up ideas for India. So his idea there was that, you know, economists should come out of the ivory tower. Uh, we, are talk, uh, we are studying uh, important problems of the world. And if there's any worth in, in what we find, it has to, the message has to go out in a clear, understandable language to the general public and the policymakers and so on. Uh, and he also believed that this, this flow has to be two way, that uh, academics should, should also learn from practitioners, from policymakers, from bureaucrats, from NGOs who, who have sort of granular level information about the world. So, so based on that philosophy, Ashok started Ideas for India, and I think it's fair to say in the last 10 years, it has become a platform for uh, uh, sort of academics, policymakers, NGOs to come together for a common conversation. Unfortunately, as you are aware, we lost Ashok earlier this year. And so this annual lecture series has been generously funded and supported by the International Growth Center. So it'll happen every year. And uh, we plan to sort of bring in uh, a leading development economist to share their sort of uh, thinking about some aspect of development, sort of give you a broad uh, picture of the landscape. Uh, now, um, so let me introduce today's first uh, uh, speaker for the uh, Ashok Kotwal Memorial Lecture. That's uh, Debraj Ray. Uh, I found that Debraj has a pretty long Wikipedia page, so that made my task simple. So I'll rattle off some information. He needs no introduction, really. But uh, just briefly to mention, um, he was educated in Presidency College and Cornell University, and has worked in Stanford, Boston, uh, and the Indian Statistical Institute. Right now, he is the Julius Silver Professor of Economics at NYU and part-time professor at Warwick. Um, he has many, many feathers in his cap. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Econometric Society, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a winner of the Mahalanobis Memorial Medal. Um, I saw that he has every place that he has taught in, he has won some uh, big teaching award, which will come as no surprise to anybody uh, who has taken his classes. And uh, I'm one of those. Now, he has many of these accomplishments. One accomplishment which is not widely known is that he was my thesis supervisor and he, he uh, managed to persuade me to uh, finish writing my thesis. Uh, so that uh, is, is, is a major uh, feather in his cap. Uh, 
So one of the reasons, there are two main reasons for asking Devraj to give today's lecture. Uh, one is, of course, you know, his, his uh, uh, numerous contributions to economic theory and to development. Uh, and to cap it all, uh, Paul Samuelson said that I don't care who writes a nation's laws, uh, I want to write its textbooks. So Devraj has lots of you know, journal level contributions, but he has written the Bible, what is now considered the Bible in development economics and what uh, students study. Uh, it's called development economics, I think. That's, that's a textbook. Uh, uh, so, so, so he's uh, uh, a leading figure in that way. And also Debraj and Ashok were great friends. Um, they had great mutual admiration. Behind their back, they would speak so highly of each other to me. And when they faced each other, they were always pulling each other's legs. Uh, they had, uh, you know, and one of Ashok's uh, great stories was, uh, I, I mean, Ashok took an hour to tell the story, so I won't take an hour, uh, thankfully. But the gist of it is Ashok had gone to Boston um, and he dropped by in Boston uh, University to say hi to Devraj. And Devraj and Michael Manor were going for a conference to Egypt. So Ashok had to, you know, that evening he had his, he had his uh, flight back to Vancouver. And these two guys persuaded him to change their his plane tickets and go to Cairo. Uh, and so, so, so he ended up in Cairo. And then that evening, they went to the market, and Debra suddenly started uh, haggling about a carpet. And so Ashok wandered off, you know. Uh, and then he came back, and he saw that uh, Debra had managed to knock down the price by 50%, and the shopkeeper was just crestfallen. But he bought this massive carpet, right? And then they were traveling all over Egypt with this huge carpet in tow. And Ashok was just keel over with laughter, saying that I was supposed to be with my family in Vancouver, and here I am standing in front of the Sphinx with carrying a carpet. So, so, so those are the kind of stories they told about each other. If you want to hear Ashok stories, you know, pick uh, the Abraham's Bains uh, during the, during the break. Okay, without further ado, let me welcome the Abraham Ray to give the first Ashok Watwal Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Parikhit. <laughs> for the slightly tongue-in-cheek but very affectionate introduction. I don't know uh, how to even begin talking about Ashok, so I'm not, I'm not really going to try, and I'm probably just going to go straight into my, uh, into my talk. Uh, but I do want to say that, uh, that Ashok meant, uh, meant a lot to me, and um, he was just, I don't know, I think everybody thought of him as, as a dear friend. He had that quality that could make any one individual feel very special. I have a photograph. Uh, let's see if this works. There's Ashok. Okay. Um, but this guy was, was something special. And um, what I really liked about him is that at the core of it all, he was just an old-fashioned theorist like I am. And he was very interested in theoretical issues. Of course, you know, as his working life progressed, he became more and more deeply involved uh, with data, working with uh, fantastic people. But uh, he always kept in mind the fact that he was an analytical guy. And his, you know, it comes out in his work, his, his beautiful work that Porikit referred to. Uh, and I want you all to see, I put in here later on, I'll send you the so here's a great quote. I, I want there's, there's a link here to a YouTube video that I want you to see uh, where Ashok talks to a bunch of undergraduates about his career. Yeah, and it's, and it's delivered in typical Ashok style. And then in the middle comes this astonishing quote, which I love. He says, the good thing about big data is that you can't wildly speculate anymore. But the bad thing about big data is that you can't wildly speculate anymore, which, which, which really cuts at the core of what, what, what Ashok was all about. Uh, so that's, I'm going to take that as an invitation for this talk, and I'm going to just wildly speculate. So this is just a wildly speculative talk, and um, we'll see where it goes. So this is a great book. Um, that I read again recently, Why Poverty Persists in India, written with, with his longtime co-author Mukesh Ishwaran. 
And um, he was deeply concerned here with questions of development and distribution. So I decided to choose that as my topic, but it's going to be a little bit more sort of speculative, crystal ball gazing, just for us to have a fun time and sort of think about where the future of development might take us, right? So that's why I've titled this talk, The Future uh, of Development. And I just want to share some of these thoughts with you, but they're not my thoughts. There are two people who are very important in developing them with me. One is Dilip Mukherjee, who isn't here because he seems to have broken his ankle. But uh, Dilip uh, and I will sort of is the subject matter of this. So we wrote the first part of the talk that I'm going to give today. And the second is Mr. Ghosh himself, Porikhit. Uh, so I, I've been working with uh, Porikhit on thinking about an India fund, which, uh, which uh, I'm going to discuss with you. So essentially, the way I want you to think about uh, distribution is that there are two aspects of it. One is functional. So the idea is how much is labor getting, how much is capital getting, right? And the other is personal, namely how you map from how much labor and capital is getting to the final personal distribution of income. And that, of course, will depend on how people are accumulating, what kind of things they're buying uh, in terms of assets and so forth. Now, if I had to talk about both of these aspects, this would be an interminably long talk. So I've decided to focus here more on the functional, but later on, I'm going to come back and comment more on, on the person. Okay? So as I've written here, uh, functional tracks changes in the price of endowments and personal tracks changes in the ownership of endowments. And a theory of economic inequality must really address uh, both components. So essentially, there are two perspectives uh, that you can see in the literature when we talk about um, economic development. The first is what one might call the balanced growth perspective, which goes back all the way to the work of Ramsey and von Neumann. And this whole idea that development is a harmonious process by which you come into some sort of steady state, right? When all of you guys learn about the solo model, for example, that's what you learn about. You come to a steady state and then you have sort of balanced growth at the rate of technical progress. Now, there was another very different view developing at that time, which goes back to the, uh, to the work of people like Arthur Lewis, Simon Kuznets, and also is the perspective that Ashok and Mukesh adopted in their book, which is that development is a sequence, an ever-changing sequence, right, of new sectors coming up. Some people being lucky enough to rush into those new sectors. Maybe they're well positioned to do so. And then everybody else rushes in after that, whereupon the relative price of that sector comes down and then some new cycle opens up. Now, many of you, all of you probably have heard of the famous Kuznets inverted U uh, hypothesis, right? And where does the Kuznets inverted U hypothesis come from? It comes from the idea that there is just one cycle. Why is that? Because Kuznets lived in the 30s and 40s and 50s when the main intersectoral movement was just going from agriculture to industry. Yeah? But of course, so that the inverted U doesn't exist because there isn't just one cycle, right? When we had the IT revolution, and all sorts of uh, 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 different cycles have come in, right? But the main idea of Kuznets is still very important that development is a sequence or what one might call disequalizing uh, or uneven changes, followed by uh, maybe comp compensating changes as the rest of the economy catches up. That's a very different view from the balanced growth model. Yeah? Part of that view, by the way, rests fundamentally, and I'll also talk about it here, on the non-homothetic of preferences. The balanced growth view cannot exist unless you assume that preferences somehow are homothetic. So as we grow, we consume the same proportions of different commodities. Because if you were to consume different proportions, you can't have a balanced growth part, right? So uh, it's obvious to any of us in this room that the assumption of homotheticity is ridiculous, right? But of course, if you take the assumption of non-homotheticity very seriously, as we should, then we are led inevitably to this, after all, why does an agriculture industry transition happen, right? It happens because preferences are fundamentally non-homothetic, yeah? So, uh, so that's the view I'm going to take over here. I'm going to talk about what I call the fourth fundamental law of capitalism, okay? So what's the fourth fundamental law of capitalism? 
is that that's the blue centers at the top. With economic growth, capital displaces labor, and the labor share in national income must progressively vanish. Okay? That's, that's what I'm going to talk about today in the first half of the talk. Okay? Now, why is it fourth? That's just for fun. The reason it's for fun is because Thomas Piketty wrote a book right, where he talks about his three fundamental laws of capitalism, which I've listed over there. So this is a little homage to Thomas Piketty. Uh, uh, I have written about his three fundamental laws elsewhere, somewhat critically, and I won't go to that. So I've decided to introduce my own law and I call it the fourth law. Okay, so this is, this is, this is how this law shall be henceforth known. But it's not going to become, can we go to the next slide? It won't go, it won't get as good as this. This is Mr. Colbert holding up uh, Piketty's third law on a T-shirt, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's going to be stated quickly enough so that it can go on a T-shirt. Mine can't. Okay, so here we go. The fourth fundamental of capitalism, law of capitalism, labor share, national income must progressively vanish. But you might say that you can't be serious. And, and the answer is, look, I'm not serious. Yeah, I'm not serious about the fact that it's a law, right? Nothing is a law. What I'm going to say is not even testable. When I say that the share, it's like saying in the long run, we are all dead, or in the long run, you're some. So it's, it's the fourth fundamental law is not even testable. Of course, I can write down stronger forms of it, which are testable. So, but, but, but what I do believe is that it's fundamental. Okay. And it's a fundamental way of organizing our thoughts. And that's what I'm going to try and do in this lecture. So my talk will have two parts. The first part will be an argument to make this fourth law. Right. And for that, I thank Dilip. Next, uh, the click on, please. And the second one is going to be a policy to address the implications of this law. And here is where I'm going to talk about uh, my work with Purikit, if you can get uh, if you can get that far. OK, a Caldor fact, a famous fact due to Nicholas Caldor is that the share of labor in national income is constant. Yeah, that's the balanced growth fact. This fact is starting to die. It's been dying for a few decades now. And here is another is a very nice picture, which comes from the work of Veronica Guerrieri, where she's looking at why, and you might ask, she's looking at the trend in labor shares over time. And you might ask, why are there so many lines? Well, there's so many lines because there is a huge percentage of the economy that goes into self-employment. When it goes into self-employment, you must make assumptions about deciding what share of self-employment income is to be called capital income and what share is, called, is, is to be called labor income. Yeah, But no matter how you cut that cake, and she cuts that cake in six different ways, if I've counted right, you see a declining share in what you're attributing to labor income. So the levels are different, okay, but the trend uh, is the same. And then uh, you see this um, for different countries as well. Um, I, I put up some graphs for you over there. So there's definitely a tendency towards a falling share. Uh, you see it, by the way, here, this is just a simple graph which talks about uh, percentage point losses uh, in, the, in the labor share. Uh, on the x-axis are different countries, which you can't see, but I have highlighted some of these countries for you. Uh, and, and you can see that with the uh, with with, with uh, one exception, Great Britain, you see a falling labor share in, in, in most OECD countries. And this is not just restricted to the economy as a whole. It's not a compositional argument. It's happening in different sectors of the economy. It's a within sector argument. Yeah. So you see this for a bunch of different sectors that the share, uh, that the labor share is falling. Now, if you want to think about why this might happen, we can think of many obvious reasons and probably all of them have some role to play in it. So one, one famous argument, of course, is globalization, the China shock. The China shock, of course, might be a good argument for developed countries, but it wouldn't explain, for example, why we continue to have, let's say, a falling labor share in India or China itself. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, this argument, I'm sure, goes part of the way, but not all. Then there is an argument entirely based on the fact that labor has become weaker in all countries. And because it's become weaker, uh, uh, the, the, you know, anti-union regulations uh, and so forth, then, then firms can take advantage of that and, and place higher markups. And when they make, place higher markups, that's, that creates a tendency for the share of capital to rise or the share of labor to fall. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's the argument that there's ongoing technical progress and these nasty robots are kind of displacing labor. 
Now, all of these, one should ask, you know, is there a deeper explanation? For example, in the case of technical progress, why is it that we should assume that technical progress is set up in you know, some divine way to displace labor, right? Why can't it be that technical progress goes the other way around and displaces capital and makes labor very good at producing things? So there's no particular conceptual reason to believe that technical progress will be biased on one side. So I'm going to come back to that issue later on. But the one argument that I think really sticks, there's something robust and strong about the argument, comes from actually the Ricardian theory of rent. So let's go back and think about what Ricardo said. So Ricardo said, as the world progresses, land will inherit the earth. Okay, well, that's almost a tautology, okay, because that's what the earth is made of. But the idea being that land is a fixed factor, everything else is growing, and therefore the returns to land have to progressively rise. Yeah. Now, fast forward a couple of centuries, and we are in a situation where we are relatively free of land, okay, not, not entirely, relatively free of land. And we can think of, as a first order approximation, as labor taking the role of land. Now, of course, there's population growth, right? But think of it, uh, net out that treadmill, and just think of everything per capita, okay? So there's labor. Think of labor as the fixed factor relatively speaking, after taking population growth out. And now think of accumulation of capital, right? So capital is accumulating. Now the fixed factor, so to speak, is labor. So if you apply the same idea, there will be a tendency to substitute regularly away from labor as long as an economy is growing. Yeah? So that's the idea that I want to try and develop. And of course, you see this uh, uh, in the data, th th this particular diagram uh, has on its vertical axis the, the prices of investment goods. And there's a secular tendency for the price of investment goods to fall. Okay, So as the price of investment goods is falling, it's coming from the very nature of the fact that we are getting richer per capita. If we didn't get richer per capita, this wouldn't happen. But if we got richer per capita, then it has to be that capital has to become relatively abundant relative to labor, okay? So there's this move towards capital. Now, um, and you see this, for example, in the data, I'm going to just show you this jobless, the, you know, jo we all complain about jobless growth in India. Jobless growth is a, is a thing, right? I mean, it's not just an Indian thing. It's maybe quint you know, quite a bit of an Indian thing, but it's around, yeah? So these are employment elasticities by by sector for different regions yeah, uh, of the world. And you see employment, so an employment elasticity means if output grows by 1%, what's happening to employment, right? And you see that these numbers are very low. I mean, in general, they're very low because there's this ongoing substitution uh, towards capital, yeah? And um, you see this also in, um, um, I wanted to show you here. This is a, a more direct evidence on capital labor substitution, where you just look at the rates of uh, per capita growth, right, of, of GDP, and look at the rate of employment growth next to it. I mean, I've just put India in red because it's pretty dramatic, actually, right? So you have, you know, India growing at close to 6%, uh, then growing at rates of 7% per capita, right? And employment growth is essentially not not happening. Yeah? So this, you know, this, this can only happen if there's a progressive move away from labor to greater reliance on capital, either through a compositional effect or a within sector effect, you know, whatever you like. Yeah? Now, so capital labor substitution is intuitively compelling. There's no doubt about it, right? But most of you sitting in this room who know about how to move across an isocorn from one direction to another, We'll say that this has no particular implication for the share, for the income share of an input, right? And why is that? Well, that's because the price is going up and the amount of labor is coming down. You have to multiply the two and then, then you figure out what the share is, right? And that's ambiguous. As you know, if you take, for example, the Cobb Douglas production function, then the share is going to be independent of the relative price of capital and labor, okay? So we have to ask a little bit more. So what is it that makes the share move in a particular direction, even when we understand and appreciate that capital labor substitution is going on? So I hope this is clear, the distinction between capital labor substitution, right, and the share of a particular input in national income. 
Um, so as I said, this theory doesn't, doesn't make, of course, there could be certain shocks like the pandemic, right? Where the pandemic has been a terrible thing for many of us, but in one sense, it's an insidiously bad thing because owners of businesses, entrepreneurs have realized that labor cannot be entirely relied upon. Yeah. And this, this is, I, I, it is a little prediction of mine that this is going to actually enhance the capital labor substitution. Well, enhance is a nice word. It's going to whatever, uh, accentuate the amount of capital labor substitution uh, after this. So th that might be an interesting project for those of you uh, uh, students in the room thinking about research topics. But that's, uh, but anyway, that's not, that's not what I want to explore here directly. So I want to talk a little bit more. I want to take this thing a little bit beyond the idea of capital labor substitution. And for that, I'm going to introduce a framework which has two pillars which are fundamental. The first pillar is an asymmetry between human and physical capital. And the second pillar is going to make a distinction between two kinds of capital, which I'm going to call machine capital and robot capital. Okay, first pillar first. This is what you will write down when you write down a standard macro model of the solo of the solo variety where the inputs are getting accumulated over time. I've put in two inputs for you. The physical capital input, that's the solo equation that all of you know from any textbook. And that is a human capital growth input. That's coming from let's say any obvious extension of the solo model, Mankiw, Romer, and Weil, any standard macro model, you'll have human capital accumulating in that fashion. And what I want to do is put a big question mark underneath that second equation. What does it even mean to have that second equation? Yeah. Now, one thing about physical capital is that it's alienable, right? We can all own, we can all own shares of Reliance or Apple, we can scale up those shares to any degree we want. Yeah. What does it mean for an inalienable input like human capital? I can't own shares in your human capital. I can only own shares in my human capital. What does it mean to scale it up and down in the same fashion? And the answer is, man, like, you know, don't be silly. You know, all this is just a shorthand for education and you can just acquire more education. That's what it's trying to capture. But it's not so easy if you think about it. Yeah, it 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 doesn't mean that if you are, let's say, uh, if you have a particular job in banking, you're just going to become a better and better and better banker, right? To some extent, you can become a better banker, right? You can become a better economist, though that may be even more doubtful, right? But you can maybe move up and down in a particular sector. But the main way human capital is accumulated or taken over time is that we move from one sector to another. Maybe not us economists, right? But ordinary human beings, that's the way they go, right? They start out in a particular occupation, then they move to another occupation, a manager, whatever, that's the accumulation of human. But now, when you start thinking about human capital in that way, you realize that writing down an aggregate equation like that is profoundly misleading. And the reason it's misleading is that these occupational movements all have endogenous relative prices associated with them. And those prices are going to change over time, right? We have to track those prices. And if we write down an aggregate equation like that, you're not going to be able to track them. Now you might say, oh, are you trying to, you know, uh, uh, re resurrect the Cambridge controversy with J George, A you know, Joan Robinson and all of that? The answer is yes and no, okay? Uh, but I'm going to show you why these movements in relative prices are very important. So we continue uh, this way on. So this is the asymmetry that I want to try and capture, right? So human capital is inalienable, okay? And because it's inalienable, all claims to it has to be embodied in one body, right? It has to be embodied in one body and then you can move around and do things. With it. Whereas physical capital is alienable, right? And we can just, you know, we can put in, we can put in more machines. We can own more machines. There's no problem. So uh, the last line of this slide is the most important, which says that human capital to a first order is accumulated as we move across different occupations in the world. Yeah. So you might think, what has that to do with the price of milk? Okay, I'll come back to it, but just hold off on that. Let me get to the second point, which has to do with machines and robots, right? So machines and robots 
tries to capture the fact that they're not literally machines and robots, that physical capital has two aspects to it. The first aspect is that it's complementary with labor, right? You get to work with, uh, with a computer, let's say, or, 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 or with any kind of implement, and that increases uh, uh, the marginal product of labor, right? It's a complementary thing. And the second aspect of capital is that it has certain things in it, certain components that tend to displace labor, right? And I'm going to call these objects machines and robots. So I don't want you, you to think of a, you know, a robot sort of menacingly coming at you and swinging its hands. Even though if you go to one of these Boston Dynamics uh, YouTube videos, you see that it is pretty sinister, right? But I want you to think of robots as a sort of catch-all for artificial intelligence, machine learning, as well as physical objects, right, which can displace labor. So how do we uh, try to capture that? Well, the one easy way of trying to capture that is think of there being many sectors and they're all producing output using a standard production function. And the production function uses capital and labor. Okay, But that second object, L, I don't want you to think of as labor. I want you to think of those as tasks right, being performed in every sector. And those tasks can be performed either by human beings or by robots. Yeah. So the, the KI here are the machines, and these are the things that are complementary with tasks. And the, the tasks themselves, there's a second little production function. And that second little production function says that those tasks can be produced using either human input or a robot input. Okay. So automation is feasible. I'm not saying it's, it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's feasible. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this issue of feasibility later on, which doesn't, of course, mean that it's necessarily profitable. But that depends on the movement of relative prices. Yeah. Okay, so as I said, to summarize, capital comes in two flavors, right? It comes in the machine flavor, which is complementary to labor, and it comes in the robot flavor, which is a substitute for labor. So these are my two, two ingredients, yeah? And using those two ingredients, of course, I'm not going to sit down here and, uh, and do a lot of algebra, even Ashok won't like that, though he'd be interested. Okay, uh, I want to make the following claim. It must be that as physical capital per capita accumulates in any one sector over time, that sector must become progressively automated in, in some sort of equilibrium that I'm not writing down now. Okay, so let me explain why, why that's the case very quickly. Okay? And to do that, I'm, I, I hope this is not the first memorial lecture in which an argument by a contradiction has been made, but I'm going to try it anyway. So I'm going to argue by contradiction. Suppose that this claim is false, right? Well, then, if this claim is false, because of the Ricardian idea that labor is relatively fixed relative to capital, there must be upward pressure on the marginal product of tasks. So that's the first point that I want you to see. And the second point is that this upward pressure on the marginal product of tasks must result in ongoing increase in human wages relative to the price of capital. Now, I do want you to note, if you think about it, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but the human physical asymmetry that I talked about earlier is crucial to making this argument. If you could accumulate human capital in the same way within those tasks and physical capital, then there's no reason for, for the ratio of one to the other to move. But because human capital has limited value in any one task, it can go to another task, of course, but within that task, it is, uh, 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 it is going to move, the terms of trade will have to move in favor of labor. Step three is that the human wage rise must outpace the robot price rise. Now, the robot price rise is also being endogenously determined in this model, right? So this is, it's not entirely clear what's going to happen, right? And for this, I'm going to give you a very quick argument. Let's go to the robot sector, okay? Think about the robot sector, the sector that's producing robots. That's one of the sectors in this model, right? Now, in the robot sector, the robot price is, of course, some mix is determined by the machine capital price in the sector and the task price in the robot sector. Okay, so that I've written that down in the form of a very simple uh, equation. At the same time, the task price is a mixture of the robot price and the human wage in the robot sector. I've written that down in another equation because that's how the price of tasks are determined. And if I put those two together, I see that 
uh, machine capital prices and the human wage in the robot sector will determine the price of robots. Okay? So now as the human wage is going up relative to the price of capital, notice that the price of robots is of course going to rise, right? Because humans are being used in the production of robots, but physical capital is also used in the production of robots. So the price of robots must be some combination, some linear, not linear, some, some mixture of the price of physical capital and the price of, of, of humans. As a result of which, uh, it's true that both the price of robots must rise and the price uh, of humans, which is W, must rise, but the price of robots divided by the price of physical capital must rise more slowly than the price of humans divided by the price of physical capital, which means that this inexorable transition is going to happen along the task's production function, which gives us a contradiction to our previous uh, to our argument that there's no full automation. So if you go through the details of this later on, I can send you the slides if you're interested. You'll see that there are a couple of subtleties to this argument, but broadly speaking, this is, uh, uh, this is what happens. Now, of course, this is just for one sector. And Ashok and Mukesh have taught us that people proceed across different sectors. So there's much more work here to be done, which I can't do because of limited time. If sectors uh, uh, grow unboundedly, uh, if the sectors don't grow unboundedly, but there's still growth, it means that the number of sectors that are active in the economy must grow. And then you can make a very similar kind of argument. Okay? And that's, uh, that's what's stated here. So all of this, in short, leads to my fourth fundamental law of capitalism. Uh, perhaps looking oversimplified uh, in this very quick talk, but actually it takes uh, a little bit more to make the argument, which is that the labor share in national income must progressively vanish. Yeah. Now, this is a, to be contrasted with what this model predicts about the absolute level of wages relative to capital. Typically, that must rise. So this is not a statement about absolute impoverishment. It is a statement about a relative move towards capital. In fact, the absolute increase in wages is generally needed in order for this automation to happen. So all of this is happening endogenously uh, along the path of this model. So as I said, this is a relativistic battle between capital and labor. It's a relativistic battle that Thomas Piketty was interested in, but could not have studied because his book is entirely based on an aggregative model. The entire argument here is based on disaggregation. Yeah? Uh, and it argues that in the presence of ongoing economic growth, capital must win the battle over labor in terms of share. Okay. So now, I, you know, this is just a little bit of fantasy, but I want you to think about it. Let's think about the future, you know what it means, right? So, Let's think about what, how can we escape this repugnant conclusion, right? As the philosophers would say, how do we escape this conclusion? So let's think about a couple of escape routes. One escape route is that per capita capital accumulation dies out. It could happen, you know, we don't know. It may be that there's not going to be any growth in the future. If there's no growth in, this future, in the future, this argument fails, okay? Because then the labor share is going to settle down. And that may be a possible outcome of this model, because the model is presuming that there is ongoing growth. I want you to just keep that in your mind, you know, think of, do, you know, think of it as you will. But of course, generally, the higher the bound on per capita capital, the lower is going to be the share of labor. Yeah? And my argument was just stated a very strong way. That's all. The second is, Man, you're telling me that every sector can be automated. Maybe some sectors can't be automated. Okay. Now, to some, some degree, this may be wishful thinking, right? I mean, yesterday uh, I was at Bhaskar's house and we were all reading out poems written by, by AI, uh, by AI uh, systems. But in any case, it's possible, right? Handicrafts, by definition, may not be automatable, right? Uh, but of course, these fully protected sectors have to have a market demand for them. It's not just enough to say, oh, there are sectors where we can be poets and philosophers, but there has to be a market demand for poets and philosophers. Otherwise, that's not going to work. Yeah. So as I've written down, philosophers, poets, novelists, musicians, will market demand sustain those sectors? I hope so. 
right? Uh, and if they do, then we'll be fine, but they, I, I wouldn't bet on it, yeah? Um, what about researchers? What about the guys who think about the new technologies? Maybe we'll all become researchers. Well, I wouldn't bet on that either, yeah? Uh, because uh, of a very famous book by von Neumann, where he argues that what he calls the singularity, right? That there is a real possibility that robots in the broad sense, can be produced by means of robots, right? Uh, and that singularity is not a happy singularity that we might want to go to, at least from the point of view of distribution, right? Maybe in, in terms of per capita, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the second one. The third one is, well, maybe some sectors are not automated, but, uh, you know, maybe there are no such thing as a fully protected sector, but it may be that there'll be constantly new sectors coming up as if by divine ordination, right? Uh, we'll have new sectors which are progressively more and more friendly to humans. So as the human way changes, we are going to be able to move to those sectors over time. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe that could happen. It depends on the composition of demand as income changes. And Ashok had actually said, ha had something to say about this in his book, right? So here's a little quote from Ashok. You know, poor Ashok was not indulging in this sort of flight of fantasy, but he did think about what happens to capital intensity as we move, as we become richer and richer and look at the derived demand. So here's a quote. When we consider luxury goods like, you know, you have to, you know, this is writing this in 1994, luxury goods like refrigerators, washing machines, video recorders, and the like, it seems clear that these are highly capital intensive goods. This is certainly so in comparison with the industrial products that can be thought of as necessities like footwear, kitchenware, bicycles. It might appear that some luxury services like five-star hotels or airline services are very labor intensive, but they would not appear so if you take into account the enormous amounts of capital required to purchase the, uh, to purchase the aircraft or build the hotels. So what is Ashok saying here? He's saying that there's a positive correlation between compositional changes and the reliance on capital. Well, if that's the case, then that's the opposite of this escape route, right? So if you believe Ashok, then he, he doesn't buy this route, right? Um, but it, maybe that he's wrong, right? Maybe, maybe we'll all move towards uh, things that protect uh, humans over time. And finally, the fourth escape route, technical progress. Maybe technical progress will always be set up in a way that it benefits humans and not machines. Well, the fossil record doesn't, uh, do, is not very encouraging on that, right? Uh, technical progress, of course, has benefited humans, but on, on the whole, technical progress has made, has built more and more powerful machines. But it may be that that's a possibility, yeah? Um, so there's an extension of this argument, which I can't get into, of course, which is to, which is to say that if you have symmetric technical pro if you think of endogenous technical progress not the kind that we do in the solo model but we think of inventors responding to where the relative prices are high okay let's go there and do technical progress let's bring that so now 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 go back to my original argument the ricardian argument where the human wage is going up right relative to uh, to to machine capital and imagine that you were an inventor who was trying to sell a nice new technique right in such a world, what technique would you sell? You'll sell a technique that displaces labor even faster because that's the guy whose price is going up, right? Of course, it can't be too fast because if you do it too fast, then the price of labor is gonna collapse, right? If the price of labor collapses, then you lose the general equilibrium nature of the exercise. So the general equilibrium nature of the exercise is quite subtle. It says that labor has to be displaced, but it cannot be displaced too quickly. Right? Because if it's displaced too quickly, then the very forces that are creating that displacement are not going to happen. Yeah? So there's, there's a fair amount of subtlety in thinking about that. But if you have to think about technical progress, which is directed, we probably go in the opposite direction. Okay. So I had lots of funny things, stories to tell you about technical progress, but we have to really move on here. Okay. So in summary, the fourth law has the following features. It relies on ongoing economic growth. It then relies on the progressive cheapening of capital relative to labor, and then the implied vanishing share of labor by automation, and yet the possibility of ongoing rising absolute wages with structural transformation.
yeah, as, as the structure of the economy keeps moving. Okay, so uh, this is the point at which Porikhit and I, and, and Ashok actually, we talked for hours about, you know, how, what, you know, how can we think about universal basic? And then, you know, this is why we had an Ideas for India symposium. I think it was in 2017 on universal basic income because, you know, it, it was all, it was all up in the air there, right? Now, of course, for India, thinking about universal basic income seems absurd because it's such a poor country, right? It's, 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 it's a rich country's problem, not a poor country's problem, right? But uh, Ashok thought not. Poriki thought not. I certainly thought not as well. And I'm going to try and convince you as to why this might be an interesting thing to think about in the Indian context, okay? So the fourth law captures an age-old anxiety that instead of land inheriting the earth, that capital will inherit the earth, okay? So this is the Piketty anxiety. But of course, the real worry should be the personal distribution of income, as I was telling you about before, right? And that depends on individual holdings of labor and capital. And we've had dramatic changes in access to equity, right? Uh, people can access the stock market, even in, even in India, right? People can access the stock market at, at, in a way that they could never access before. But, um, but yet, however, the old themes that we know about of convergence and divergence sort of rear their heads once again, right? Uh, is it true that the market is going to be equalizing, disequalizing? Now I'm talking in terms of personal distribution. Now notice that these old themes where people like Abhijit and uh, my, you know, my work with, with, with Partha, uh, Galore and Zaira, uh, with, my work with Dilip, all of these old themes on studying convergence and divergence are done on an ambient background of steady state, where the relative prices of inputs are constant. And the focus is on whether poor people can get access uh, to those, to the better paid inputs, right? Whether they can, whether they can gain access in terms of holding them. And even there, we have a problem, right? As, as, we, as, as we know from uh, Abhijit and Andy's work, Banerjee and Newman and Galore and Zera, we know that we have a problem there. Even there, now imagine you tilt the treadmill and you put in the fourth fundamental law of capitalism, right? And everything is sliding towards capital. And now you want to redo all of these exercises, but on a tilted treadmill, right? How people can now... Can, you know, can they, can, can they overcome? Then you can intuitively see that it's going to be harder, right? Um, there isn't a theorem because I haven't written down something like that, but you can intuitively say that the problem becomes much harder. So we become even more pessimistic, right, about, about, uh, uh, about these forces. Okay. So, um, and it's in this context that universal uh, uh, basic income becomes a big deal, right? Now, I'm going to very, even though universal basic income is something that I teased you with saying that I will talk about it, I would want to talk about only one aspect of it, which is possibly new to you, okay? And, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So the usual idea of universal basic income, the, the usual uh, debates, let's think about the debates. Uh, is it truly universal? Is it going to be targeted? Uh, what are going to be the economic incentives? Are going to people sit around and play the harmonium while they get income every, uh, every month? The usual right-wing arguments, left-wing arguments. Here's, a, here's an important left-wing argument. Uh, what about Enrega? What's going to happen to healthcare? What happens to nutrition? What happens to social insurance? Yeah. Um, what happens when there's inflation? Are we going to be able to index a universal basic income? Is, is this really a capitalist plot yeah, to, to remove people from their rights to Enrega? And th these are very important questions. When Purikit and I wrote about, this is a quote from our paper, we wrote that universal basic income is a genuine structural distributive transfer. Um, its proper consideration must appear on top of social insurance programs, yeah? Like uh, not as a substitute. Whatever social insurance we do have, such as in Rega, should not be cannibalized for the purpose of making structural transfers, such as a universal basic income. So this is our position on the matter. This is not a substitute for social insurance. It is actually a structurally distributive transfer. Yeah. So that's that's one point I wanted to make. And of course, as you might imagine, if you wanted to do some back of the envelope calculations on how 
how much money we'd need. You need a lot of money. Here's, here's to, here, just to give you an idea, um, how expensive is it? Well, we know that India is full of, of, of redistributive schemes and directed subsidies, food, fertilizer, trying to name it, there's, a, there's probably a, a directed subsidy, okay? And we're talking here, not counting state level subsidies. When I last did this calculation, which was probably a year ago, it's about 6% of GDP, which is huge, yeah? Um, now, if you go to the to the Rangarajan Committee's uh, poverty line, it's like just under a thousand rupees per month for rural, and I think a thousand three hundred. Maybe they index it a little bit. I don't know. And a thousand four hundred for urban. Um, if you average that out, looking at the percentages of people in the rural and the urban sector, you get about thirteen thousand rupees per person just to get them to poverty line, right? When you take that 13,000 rupees per person and multiply it by the population of our beloved country, you are going to again get a very large number. But just to give you a sort of, you know, back of the envelope idea, it's about twice, giving a universal basic income at poverty line to everybody in the population is about twice the, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of subsidies that we already give in some sort of directed form. That's, that's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. Now we can use this to dump on subsidies. That would be one direction we could go in. My God, even just with twice the money, we can cover everybody at poverty line. We, we can have that discussion. But I want to go in a slightly different uh, direction for the last uh, five minutes of my talk, okay? Um, which is that I want you to think about, I call it the universal basic share because I think of it as, as a percentage of income, but let's, let, let's not go into the details there. It's a, really a dividend that we pay from national wealth. It's the way uh, Alaska play, pays its dividend out to its citizens. It's based on, uh, it's based on natural resources in Alaska. And this is the this is our, this is the common inheritance of Alaska, right? So that's the Alaska Permanent Fund. It takes 25% of state income from natural resources and pays the citizens a, divid uh, a dividend. Here's a country that uh, doesn't pay a dividend at all. It's hanging on, right? Except for certain, which is Norway, right? The Norway Fund. The Norway Fund, when I just, got after the recent changes in the price of oil, is about $250,000 per person. It's sitting there, right? Um, Norwegians, of course, have hired a philosopher to look after the, how the fund should be invested and all of, all of that. But there's the Norway fund. Now, when you see these funds, you start thinking, why are these funds based on resources? Why can't they be based on corporate wealth? Okay. Why can't it be based on the overall financial wealth of an economy? So let's so, so, so let's 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 dream for three more minutes, and then uh, the, yeah, then, uh, then, uh, then I'll stop. So let's think about it. So why why should sovereign funds not go beyond natural resources? And this is both a philosophical and a pragmatic question. It's philosophical because of the first part of my talk, right? All of this fourth law and divergence and so forth. Okay, so that uh, that we we help fundamentally people hold the national wealth, but but the government is holding it. Uh, the pragmatics, which is, which is what Porikhit and I find interesting, comes from the logistics of this fund building. And obviously, Porikhit and I are not the first to think about this, right? There's, there's a lot of different kinds of proposals in the United States. Make charitable contributions to a national fund, right? Or uh, put in an extra financial transactions tax or a higher tax on capital incomes, transfer existing government assets to a national fund, or take auction proceeds from, you know, auction spectra, spectrum auctions, various levies and so forth. So it's all around, okay? Um, Cory Kitt and my proposal is far simpler, okay? And, and, and the proposal obviously has its flaws, yeah? So I'm gonna end by talking about this. They say that India, and developed countries, if they like, should build a sovereign fund. We are going to call it an India fund. Okay, this is the India fund. The India fund says uh, it'll hold a portfolio of equity, bonds, and financial assets. Okay, um, it'll be managed professionally as any other fund would be managed, right? Subject to certain constraints, um, and the fraction of this return, maybe not now, but in the future, fifty years from now can be paid out as a national dividend. It's our common national dividend, yeah, that we pay it out. But the payout would have to be slow. The patience is of the essence. We, India still has a pretty nascent stock market. So this is, this is not a proposal for the present, but it's a proposal to start now. Okay. Now, the proposal has 
two parts to it. The first part is a one-time directive on existing publicly traded companies. Okay, it says take your existing share base and issue X percent of that, where X is a number we can discuss, maybe 3%, maybe 10%, issue new shares to the tune of X percent okay, of, the, of your existing share base. And the government is going to hold it. Well, as you can imagine, the Confederation of Indian Industries may not be happy with this proposal, yeah? But I, 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 I would like to put it forward, okay? So we say, we, now, there's an immediate dilution of shareholder value. Boing, down comes the shareholder value, right? We've diluted it by one minus X, yeah? Okay, too bad. But it's a very cool way of paying taxes. It's a cool way of paying taxes because you don't even need to know whose wealth is what. You've just diluted it at the source, yeah? Uh, so that's the first part. And the second part is that whenever there is a new share issue, X percent of that has to be diluted out. In other words, X percent of that new share issue has to be given to the government. The government holds it. Yeah. Whether it's an IPO, whether it is an expansion of the existing shares, I don't, we don't care. Yeah. Okay. So this is payment via dilution, and this is conceivably the most compelling point in favor of the plan. Yeah. And the stock issues are by listed firms are easy to track. Uh, they, you don't have to audit the portfolios of any individuals. And every investor automatically pays. As Porikit put it, uh, where is Porikit's great line here? Uh, that's like, Elon, just send us the stock and save the brokerage fee. This was when Elon was uh, selling some stock in order to pay his capital gains taxes. No, don't worry, just give us the stock. We don't, we don't need to sell it. I'm going to come to a stop here, but, I'm, uh, but I do want to say that this proposal is discussed in detail in our paper. Uh, we are pretty, uh, you know, I think we are going off out on a limb here, but we don't go entirely out on a limb. We talk about several advantages. Uh, we talk about the distinction between this plan and classical socialism, for example. Uh, and we talk about what kind of class, maybe class B shares issued to the state, what kind of control rights the state has and so forth. Uh, we talk about different kinds of political incentives and we talk about the limitations of this object. Okay, so I, I, I also want to, um, there, there are different limitations and concerns because there are distortions that are being created in capital markets when you impose a share levy like this. And therefore, there may be an increasing movement towards debt rather than equity. There, there may be a reversal of in, 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 whatever the word is, incorporatization of firms. Uh, and these are all inefficient. Yeah, so this is, not, this is not a first best proposal. It's a second best proposal because of the distortion effects. And uh, so we talk about these distortions in some detail. So I'm going to, I think this is a good point to bring this to a halt. Um, and let me, I think, let me just summarize. I just want to end by saying that Ashok loved talking about these things with us. He was always at it. He would be on the phone. Hey, Dev Raj, what do you think about the blah, blah? He would start off, right? So, and, and Porikit, of course, even more because Porikit, he treated Porikit really like his own son. I know that. Um, so I, I, I just want to uh, summarize here. I, I, my talk was in two parts. I talked about the fourth fundamental law, which is that the labor share must decline even as absolute wages rise. We discussed different aspects of this so-called law, right? And then the main lesson is labor is the only endowment we have that's given to us at birth, right? Everything else needs to be accumulated. Either we accumulate it ourselves and we get our reliance shares in our pockets, but given the distribution in society, it may be very hard for people to do that, or this is a real role for the state, not on the grounds of prayer to inefficiency, on the grounds of distribution, to give a minimum floor to everyone on a relativistic basis, yeah? And uh, that's the argument. And we've talked about building a social fund on the basis of shared dilution. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Devraza, for a captivating talk. Uh, let me just briefly mention, since uh, he uh, talked about Ashok at the end, uh, I landed up in UBC. I was hired by Ashok, who was the department chair then. And I remember in the early like 2000s, Ashok was talking about, uh, you know, 
globalization and mechanization and automation uh, kind of being a, a major major force in the world which will be very very disruptive and he was he was not an empiricist at the time he was he was a theorist but he was prophetic uh, he's the first person who i saw or heard uh, you know talking about these things in a in a major major way so okay, we'll now throw open uh, uh, throw it open to the floor for questions so we have two sources of questions uh, we'll take some from uh, all of you assembled here but there is uh, this is also being um, you know live telecast on youtube so there will be some questions there but we'll get to that uh, later so please raise your hand if you have a question we'll take the microphone to you and please uh, be a little brief because we want to take as many questions as possible thank you yeah, so, hey. uh, or dilute the junior most claim as opposed to gross profits at the source, senior to everybody, for the nation. The nation gets first dibs. Uh, sorry, yes. I, the I, nation I, gets first dibs. First on, dibs on, on revenue? Well, what do you mean by gross, gross profits? profits? As opposed to absolutely at the bottom of the, uh, you know, chain uh, yeah, from share equity. Value, share value is proportional to the bottom line, right? Uh, it it will take out. There are more senior claims. Taxation is senior most, then uh, debt is senior. Right. Junior to that, senior to equity. I, I understand your point now. Thank you. Yeah. So we are not, there's existing systems of taxation. We know that it comes with its own problems, right? You have to identify who's earning what. Now, in the organized corporate sector, this might be very easy, right? But if you or Chishman, and just decide, if you're a billionaire on the on the sly, you live in the Isle of Man, right? And you're holding a huge amount of Indian stocks. There's no way we can get at you. The only way we can get at you is to dilute you and uh, dilute your shareholdings, in other words. So we're not saying that, oh, we should tax people more and have a sovereign fund. We want to build a fund that exactly mimics the corporate composition of India at any one point of time. And that's, by the way, leads to another interesting issue about how much can we actively trade this fund? And I didn't, I didn't talk about it, but the whole idea would be to try and mimic the overall composition of, 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 of the Bombay Stock Exchange, let's say. And of course, it's, it's also limited in that it's only focused on corp, incorporated wealth, right? And so the, I take that point. Yeah. You talked about a theme which justifies that data, right? Uh, okay. I think, yeah. So is, is it the only th plausible theory that you can think of to justify the data or can some other theory also justify the non Keldor facts, whatever? Okay, good. No, no, the answer is that it's not the only theory that can justify the data. I talked about several other things. Remember the China shock? I talked about uh, uh, your the changing margins because of weakened labor, right? It may be that technical progress is biased in some intrinsic way. There are many other ways to fit those facts. This is not a statement that this is the only way to fit the facts. This to have this for us to speculate in the Kotwalian sense. Yeah, about this. Okay. There was another question back there. Uh, thanks, Professor, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I have a question related to the law, uh, this fundamental laws of motion of capital you have uh, talked about. Uh, so there is a law of motion of capitalist mode of production by Marx. So there also there is a concentration of capital and which we, which would eventually lead to fall in the uh, uh, rate of growth of profit and that would cause crisis in the system. So how your model is different from that that particular model where crisis is ultimately the, uh, uh, I hear you. the I conclusion understand. of the model. Yeah, I am, that's a good question. So the Marxian notion of, of, of concentration of capital is a statement about the personal distribution. It's a statement about how capital will be concentrated in the hands of a few people. This is not that statement. This is a statement about capital as an input versus labor as an input. And this is talking about how the return to capital is going to dominate uh, uh, the return to labor in the long run. So just to give you an example, suppose all of us, suppose there's only one stock, let's say Apple, and we all hold Apple. Yeah, we all hold Apple and we all have labor. Then this law will still hold, but there will not be any concentration of, of wealth 
among a few people. So if you like, this is an orthogonal law to the Marxian notion that things are going to get concentrated. It's orthogonal because that's a statement about the personal distribution. And this is a statement about the functional distribution. Any more? About just one scenario which links the fund to universal basic income payments. And, you know, your lecture makes me think a little bit about these pay-go systems that were set up in Social Security. And so, for example, if we have the fund and we use returns for a year to then pay out basic income, then it's going to be sensitive to the state of the cycle, the business cycle. Correct. So so some of these questions that have come up with pay-go systems in terms of stability, uh, I just didn't know what the link was between the paying out and the actual holding of the Correct. assets. So just one possible scenario for that. Correct. Yeah. So there's the usual issue of a, of a university endowment, you know, how we spend it, how we disperse it, smoothing over time and so forth. All of these issues are going to come up. Yeah. Um, the only thing is that it's going to be a hugely diversified fund, as diversified as the economy of India, by definition, right? Because every every stock is going to get taxed. Nevertheless, that will not stop it from uh, sustaining, from getting uh, macroeconomic shocks, right? Which and so this is an issue that we discussed to some degree in the paper. But we were so caught up on creating the idea of a fund in the first place that we thought that at least let's get that on the table. And then we can talk about these other issues, which are just as important, but somewhat more conventional than how to fund this fund. And that, so I, I, I'm agreeing with that, but I'm punting on it because I just want to focus at this point on how such a fund should be set up. So like, like Orshishman's thing, why not do this? Why not tax this? Or, or we are saying, let's just do it by shared dilution. Everything else is conventional. Bharat, pause here. Yeah. How long would it take for the share to vanish? I'm asking this because if if there's a possible scenario in which wages keep increasing, right? And most of the tasks are done by, by robots, then we have to work very little, but we could enjoy an increasing standard of living, right? As long as the share doesn't get to zero. That's correct. Even if the share goes to zero, we could enjoy a decent standard of living. Because as I said, absolute wages relative to uh, the price of consumption goods and capital might, might keep rising, even if the share goes to zero. But the point is, in, in this mystical society that I'm thinking about, there's going to be enormously high inequalities of income. So it's, it's a, really a statement about relativist, relativistic distribution, rather than the question of having an absolute uh, in fact, the whole model presumes that there's growth to start with. So, um, so it was just really trying to explore this idea of, of very high relative inequalities. We have a question from Anurag, who is joining us on Zoom. Um, and he asks, as an economy progresses, the wages for unskilled workers increase due to lack of supply. Has your fourth law taken this into consideration? Right. So uh, actually, if you look at the work of, okay, so let's take an example. Let's consider the automation of hamburgers, right? Um, of course, it can be automated. It can be very easily automated. But is it profitable to automate hamburgers? Obviously not, right? Because there's lots of cheap labor around. Yeah. If there's lots of cheap labor around, the automation is not going to happen. So this, the process only comes into play when wages rise sufficiently in a particular sector, right? So then you might say, well, there'll always be, you know, in Arthur Lewis style, we'll always have impoverished labor. Well, maybe if we always have impoverished labor, then this process is not going to happen, right? Uh, but it's not just a question of know-how, it's a question of when it becomes uh, profitable to carry out the substitution. So if you look at David Autor's work, for example, you'll see that he talks about a vanishing of the middle. So it's in the middle that wages are high enough so that it's worth automating, right? At the top end, we still have the researchers who are ruling the roost. Uh, human labor is very important at the top, so that, that's protected for now. And at the bottom, we're also protected, quote unquote protected, because they're, but they're protected because the wages are still so low, right? So if you look at the automation as a function of the uh, of the economic importance of the job, then that function is typically U-shaped. Yeah. Uh, did I get that right? U-shaped? The other way around. 
inverted U shaped. Maximal automation in the middle, minimal automation on the sides. I hope that answers your question to some extent. Som had. Yeah. So, um, so what's the connection? I'm trying to figure out what is the connection between the first and second parts of your talk. So, the, is it just the motivation that there's increasing uh, inequality in the personal distribution, which you're saying comes about because the ownership of capital will continue to be unequal or get more unequal? Uh, that's one. And then the second thing is that with regarding the proposal itself, um, there have been lots of proposals for things like capital, universal capital grants and and so on, right? Piketty, for example, has one, but many others have proposed these things. Mm -hmm. um, and why is having... Why is this any different or any better or whatever? Well, what's the motivation? Is it because you think that it'll be better, yeah. wealth, will, wealth will be better managed that way or... Um, Okay, so the, uh, uh, my answer to your first question is yes. The first part of my talk was indeed a motivation for the second part. And it is a motivation, but it's a very abstract philosophical motivation. None of this is happening now. I mean, or maybe it is, I don't know. But I want to think in the next, over the next 50 or 100 years, is there a general secular trend towards labor getting thrown out? And are the first intimations of this, like jobless growth or whatever, are these perhaps the first warning signs that something broader is afoot? Okay, so that's that's really and not any more detail than that. The second one I would like to be, I would like to push back more strongly on, which is that what I really believe that shared dilution as a way of building a fund has two advantages. The first advantage is that you can get at people without having to know what they hold. I think this is extremely important. Anybody working on, 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 on fiscal safety, not just in India, but even in developed countries like the United States, where auditing has become a real problem, uh, will understand that there are advantages here to be gained from being able to just unilaterally dilute shares. Disadvantages too, as I keep saying, right? There could be distortions and so forth. Okay. The second advantage of doing it through shared dilution is that you can mimic the corporate composition of, uh, of wealth or financial wealth in a society. You can mimic it exactly because all of these, every corporate will be paying out the same percentage in terms of dilution. Now, that composition, sorry, so please go ahead. I mean, that's this one time thing, right? But in the real world, fact is the wealth continues to increase. And so you're going to have to keep diluting. Yes, that was the second part of our proposal that you dilute each time there's a share issue. You don't have to keep diluting if the existing share base is constant because the government is going to benefit from that by the rise in the share price. It's never going to be constant, right? In a growing economy, you're going to incorporate new wealth. Okay, but otherwise the incorporated so, wealth will be a shrinking share. So, Mama, hear me out. Hear me out. There are two ways to there are two ways to have higher wealth. On the basis of an existing share base that's fixed, just the wealth is going up, so the share prices are going up. And the second is that you introduce new shares. Okay, these are two different things. Now, on the first, you don't have to do anything. You sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight because the government's the, the, the government share shareholdings is going to go up as well. On the second one. You have to put in the X percent again, so it's not a it's not a it's not a flow tax, it's a stock tax. Does, does that make sense? You're you're going to have to do this every time there's a new share issue, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. That is indeed correct. So that's what I'm. And that's not, but that's not the same as doing it every time wealth goes up. Okay. Amrito, I have two part question. So the the first part is. The data on this really starts falling the labor share post-1980. So we really have 30 years of thereabouts. Um, and then there is a longer history of, of, of these income shares data, which in some sense was Kuznets was responding to all of that. So we've got, I mean, is there a thing about that maybe we are trying to construct too much? This could be a temporary uh, of course. phase and we are sort of constructing laws, even though this may be... Absolutely. Uh, so there's that. I mean, I just wanted your. So, how much yeah. uh, weight do you put on that? And 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 the second part is uh, in this weight of avoiding this trap. You said one of these things was 
um, moving into newer and newer sectors. So I, I think my sense from the way you structured it was preferences were somewhat invariant that you, you, we sort of, but you know, a lot of this love for new things uh, might well be based on things that we don't find or things that are vanishing might be, uh, you, you know, in some sense, if things that are much more labor intensive become uh, things that we start valuing and that's about preferences. And very, good, very, good. very good. Okay. So the answer to your first question is I'm not relying so much on the data. We see it happening over the last 30, 40 years, right? But I'm not relying, I'm relying really on Ricardo's intuition about the theory of land. Okay. I'm really relying on the fact that think if people are accumulating capital per capita, take this one sentence from me, now, if not anything else, if people are accumulating capital per capita, then capital endowment has to grow relative to the labor endowment, that there's an inbuilt tendency for things to shift against labor, as long as there is growth. If there is decline, it's the other way around. Yeah, and if it's stationary, there's none. So that's the, a quick answer to your first question. The second is precisely uh, the Eswaran Kotwal quotation that I put up, which is that as we move from sector to sector, maybe we develop a taste for labor-intensive things. Then it's all cool. Right. I mean, then this model, if, if we can always find new niches, right, which are progressively more labor friendly, we're all OK. Ashok doesn't think so. He thinks that as we move, things get more capital intensive. But notice this is for the students. Notice how interesting these questions are from the point of view of research. Right. Is we are asking preferences are non-homothetic. Everybody knows that. Right. But. In what way are they non-homothetic? Are they non-homothetic in a way that encourages the use of capital? Or are they non-homothetic in a way that encourages the use of labor? You won't get that in a standard textbook. Yeah. So that's 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 the takeaway. So I agree with you, but I want to leave it as an open uh, as an open question. Um, so uh, the first part of the talk you showed a couple of graphs. It shows that uh, the labor set started declining from early 70s. Uh, so that means when when the robot did not appear, so there must be some fundamental or fundamental factors. So if we accept Piketty's thought also, so may, maybe capital or machine might have. Worked. So that means you have accepted first or second or third law, whatever you said. So in that case, the way you have treated the machine and the robot, you treat it differently. That may not be also true. Right. Okay, so firstly, don't take the word robot so seriously. Yeah, but what it means is that is there a tendency to design methods of production that are displacing labor? That, that that's really, and that of course goes back even more years than the seventies. Yeah, um, and secondly, as I, I as I want to emphasize again, I really believe that this labor share has been declining for a variety of reasons. It is ridiculous to claim that there is just one theory that is driving this whole thing. Right? All I'm using this is as a little springboard for saying that, look, let's entertain this idea as well because it's built up. So I, I take your point. Uh, as, as much as I see the benefits of the UBI, I was just wondering, is there a danger that the dilution of shares causes the private sector to underperform or act as a disincentive for innovation? Right. Very good question. Okay, so this is discussed quite a bit in the paper. So there's two dangers. One is the danger which, which Soma and I were discussing, that every new share issue, there's X percent. Then there's the other danger, which is even more sinister. The second danger is, what if we decided to another, do another X percent on the existing share base, right? Okay, so these are two different questions. The first one gives you a standard uh, public finance distortion of the form that we get in income taxes. I, I, we have not much more to say on that matter. But the real worry is, what if there's another intrusion into the share base, right? And I think that that is a real worry. And, and, and we discussed this. And somehow, can a government generate credibility by saying, we are starting this process. We have to go at the existing base, but we're going to do it once. Yeah. Well, does that need a constitutional amendment? I don't know, right? But I think it's, we should be open enough to thinking about these issues. So we talk a lot about theory, but I wanted to know about the empirical speculation that we have for India. So a popular thought amongst the AI community is that 
AI is not sort of displacing jobs, rather it is creating ones, except for the jobs that are created are not for the same labor that has been displaced in the sure. process, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens, uh, and this is related to the sovereign funds argument that you also put forward, what happens when the share of labor of, say, high skill, the demand of those relative uh, labor for high skill is going up, but the share is not going up in India. So there's an increase in the lower skill labors relative to that of high skill, but the demand for high skill is going up. In that sense, the absolute wages are not increasing as much as you'd like them to be. So what happens in that case? Right. So uh, actually, when you, when you simulate a model like the first one that I wrote down, it gives rise to lots of cycles for precisely the reason you're talking about. Whenever a particular thing like this happens, the demand for labor actually goes up in one, one sector and comes down in another, right? And so the whole process is a highly non-monotonic process. So when Bharat asked, for example, how long will it take for this thing to happen? Is there a sort of monotonicity result? Can we, can, of course, it's too much to hope that one economic theory will give you a quantitative thing. That's silly uh, to think about. But at least can we say, okay, if this process goes at this rate for another 100 years, what can we say? And this model is not very good at that. It's not very good at that precisely for the reason that you're giving, that, uh, that capital is always schizophrenic, right? It's always displacing as it is embracing. But what this model does give you is that overall, there is a tendency towards, at least the prediction is, overall, there is a tendency towards displacement. Okay, so uh, good point. Uh, yeah, I think I'm a big fan of sovereign wealth funds in the way that you presented it. And uh, I also just want to add that in terms of Europe, that's also something that's quite relevant because there you have an aging population and you have a decreasing labor force. That's something that might not be in the view of people on, on in India itself. Uh, my question was, I would like to push you a bit more about the distortions that you seem to ignore. You don't think to, that they would be very significant. In the United States, there is this big trend of going private and taking firms out of the equity market, out of the um, stock market and putting them into private. So they, that would not work in your framework, if I'm correct. So how would you respond to that? Because if I'm a capital owner, I would just say I go private so I don't have to pay your dilution. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't get your main argument. Could you just? So my main argument is there are different structures of capital that I could choose for a firm. One is I could have a, a yes. listed company, or I could go and take it private. Yes, and it's not traded anymore. Correct, correct. And then I could find some other loophole around it, so I don't have to. I'm not faced with the dilution. And you say that there are distortions. You don't worry about them because they're small. My argument is: Do you really think yes. that they're small? If I can just take the firm yes. private, have the same shareholder structure but they're not yes. shareholders anymore they're partners yes no so this this is a fair point again this is a point that we mentioned in our paper that there's the one way to react to this distortion is to issue less shares and move towards baby debt financing or go in the twitter direction right uh generally and uh that may well happen. So I think I, I would still like to float this idea. I would still like people to think about how important is incorporatization, right? How important is it is to a firm after, after a certain scale that it has to issue shares. If there's a certain inelasticity to that decision, then my arguments gather more, uh, more credibility. And if that thing is highly elastic, then this argument goes down the drain. But we, we but without even discussing it, you know, we, we don't know. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm putting this up. I, I'm not trying to be a wimp and say, I honestly don't know the answer, right? Uh, it depends on the elasticity of the importance of share issue. Uh, so uh, really stupid theoretical question. Let's assume that the fourth fundamental or the fourth law of capitalism is uh, operational. So um, capital is inheriting the earth, uh, share of labor is vanishing. Yes. That isn't particularly alarming as long as the ownership of capital is, is you know, equitable, just, et cetera, et cetera. Precisely. Yeah. So why bother about sovereign funds and the government accumulating uh, shares? Why not, you know, you know tax them or, or, or get them? and then redistribute it. It's like a second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, except of redistributing endowments. You're just, uh, you know, making the ownership of capital uh, more equitable and then letting whatever laws are operational still operate. No problem. Exactly. Okay. So 
so th this is great. Okay, so this is how I made the transition from the first part of my talk to the second. So I said, you know, functional, this is happening. Now the question is whether at a personal level, people can accumulate enough to ward off this functional change that's going on. If you can all hold Reliance shares or all hold Apple shares. And if you remember the part of the talk where I talked about convergence, divergence, uh, on a moving treadmill versus balanced growth, I talked about these whole uh, Gallows era and managing human. That addresses the difficulty of doing this in a decentralized fashion. So there's a big hole in the top, but it's not a big hole in the literature. In fact, it's the most studied uh, part of the of all of this. Yeah. So then, uh, but but assuming that people can't do that in a decentralized way, you said, well, then why not just redistribute? Use as you said, second fund uh, uh, law of the theorem. Solvent fund, you know, as the government is saying, the idea right. of redistributing income from that to the other. Exactly. Fund. So then, at that point, we have to get into the nitty-gritty of the public finance, right? Do we impose a tax on wealth? Do we impose a tax? A tax will have to be imposed, okay? Uh, sorry? On new share, as you said. I mean, uh, okay. So, uh, I, I, and the beauty of the tax on new shares is that you don't have to walk around auditing people. So then I think if, if, if you are in agreement with that, we are completely in agreement, right? I, I'm just the necessity for having a sovereign fund. I mean, you, you, you know, the shares which the government is getting. The shares to, to people. I guess there's something paternalistic about Norway and me. Uh, you don't want to give shares immediately to people. They might. Say, I, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. capital grants and stuff, which is the spirit of what I'm not. It's a different point. He's saying. In every year that, if I understood correctly, in every year that you acquire shares using this X percent, give it away, right? All of it, give it all away in a in right. Maybe I I don't know. I would rather have these things uh, be managed uh, by a professional fund owner rather than by one point three billion uh, fund owners. But maybe maybe we can give it away in ten lumps. Maybe we can give it to states. I don't know. Uh, I guess the advantage of Ronald's suggestion yes. is that this is immediate, whereas your sovereign fund, you said, maybe 50 years later. Absolutely. That is true. But compounding has its advantages. I, 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 yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, not just about you and me, man. Huh? Okay, so we are uh, out of time. We need time to set it up for the next event. Uh, thank you very much, there, brother. Thanks for all the comments. We can continue uh, this discussion later. Uh, let me take just a moment uh, before you, we leave for refreshments. Uh, I want to thank the entire uh, Ideas for India team. They have worked tirelessly to put it together. So this uh, it's Ishita Trivedi, uh, Nikita Mojumdar, uh, Frida D'Souza, uh, and then there's uh, Rohan Bharat and uh, Vikas Dimble, who are all here, and also uh, Chavi Tiwari, our Hindi editor. So now, um, Ishita will present a little token gift uh, to, to their branch. Okay, thank you very much. There's, there's uh, tea and refreshments outside. <laughs>